Lord, we just open our hearts and minds to thee now. Through the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, trusting thee to quicken thy word to us, to make it real and apply it in a very practical way to each one of our lives and situations, that it may accomplish your purposes in us and make us more fully what you want us to be as your people, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we have a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to try and go pretty quickly. First of all, a little quick review, as I warned you. We've been speaking about seven successive pictures of God's people presented in Ephesians. I would like you, without reference to your outline, to name them in their correct order. Number one, number two, number three, number four, did I hear you right? Family. Number five, temple. Number six, number seven, It's amazing. Both classes always come out clearest on the bride. It's quite surprising. Everybody remembers the bride. All right, we'll do that once more very rapidly. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, and number seven. All right. Now we'll just quickly answer in each, in respect of each one that we've studied, the three questions. What is it purpose does it serve for God? What does it require in our relationship to God? What does it require in our relationship to one another? Now, try and do it without looking at your outline. There's no marks off if you do look at your outline, because there's no marks on anyhow. The assembly, what does it uh, show of God? His government or his authority? What does it require in us? Order. And what is required toward one another? Okay, that was pretty good for some of you. Uh, secondly, the body. What purpose of God does that serve? I didn't hear many of you there. It's his agent. All right. What is required in the members in relationship to the head? Availability. All right. And what is required in our relationship to one another? Interdependence. We depend on one another. All right. Number three, the workmanship of the masterpiece. What does that display of God? His creative genius, or his many-sided wisdom. What is required in us as being part of his workmanship? Pliability, or we use another word, yieldedness. And what is required in our relationship to one another in that context? The word I gave you was mergeability, the willing to be merged together into something in which our individuality is in some sense sacrificed. All right, the fourth one was the family. What does that display of God? His fatherhood. What is required in us as his children? And what is required in us toward one another? Oh, that's right. Number five was the temple. What does that provide God with? A dwelling place. What is required in us as living stones in our relationship to God? Correctability, the willing to be cor- willingness to be chiseled, cut, shaped. And what is required in our relationship to one another? Placement, the willing to, willingness to be put in our right place. All right. We have two more um, pictures to do in our closing study. The next one is the brine. We'll ask ourselves the same three questions. The bride reveals Christ's what? That's right. Several people got it right. The answer is glory. We'll come back to the scriptures for that in a moment. What is required in us in our attitude towards Christ as the bride? Adoration is all right. Loyalty, I'd rather keep for something else. Devotion is good, but in all the parables that speak about the bridegroom and the bride, there's always one thing that's emphasized. No, no. Uh, readiness is really the right word. I put expectancy, but readiness is saying the same thing. Every one of the parables that speaks about the bride speaks about expectancy. And I believe if we are lacking in expectancy, it's questionable if we're ready to be the bride. And then in our relationship toward one another, this is a little intricate. Uh, But my answer, which I will support later, 
is that it demands that we exhort one another by example. So exhortation or example would be the, the answers I would suggest. Of course, as, as I've said before, many different answers are all perfectly reasonable. Now let's look at the statement that the bride is to reveal Christ's glory. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we look at two verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 says, But I would have you know, and whenever Paul says that, I'm sure he, he realized the majority of people didn't know. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Putting that in descending order, God the Father is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the man or the husband. The husband is the head of the woman. There is a divine order of headship that starts in heaven and moves down into every home. Now, this involves responsibilities on both sides. And so Paul says in verse 7, and we're not dealing with the question of whether ladies ought to wear hats in church, so just you know, don't get on your guard because we're not going to attack you. It says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. It was the male who was created in the image and likeness of God to show forth God's likeness and glory to the rest of the creation. But the woman is the glory of the man or the wife is the glory of the husband. The wife's responsibility is to reflect her husband's glory. And as the bride of Christ, our responsibility is to reflect his glory. This is a very deep and a very practical teaching. I don't want to take long on it, but I just want to relate it to the marriage relationship because it's so close to that between Christ and his bride. See, some ladies have got the idea that because the Bible teaches the wife should be in submission to the husband, that that implies inferiority. That is not so. Submission is not inferiority. Because Christ is in submission to the Father, but he is not inferior to the Father. In fact, he said, I and my Father are one. Submission is not inferiority, it's placement. It's being where you ought to be. And then again, there are responsibilities between husband and wife. And when I say that my wife is my glory, I'm really not placing the responsibility nearly so much on my wife as I am on myself. And it's a very challenging responsibility. Somebody asked a well-known preacher once, what kind of a Christian is Mr. Smith? And the preacher answered, I can't tell you. I haven't met his wife. I'll tell you when I've seen her. That is a very wise answer. If you want to know what a kind of Christian Mr. Smith is, look at Mrs. Smith. She's his glory. She reveals what he's really like. And to me, this challenge is the husband much more than the wife. If you want to know what kind of a Christian I am, you have to look at my wife. If my wife is restful, secure, joyful, fruitful, relaxed, she's my glory. But if she's insecure and frustrated and bitter, it tells you a lot about me. And she is not my glory. It's my business to protect her. It says in Ephesians 5, Christ is the saviour of the body, which is the church. You see, it all began, actually, we don't see this so much, but the problems of the human race began when the man failed to protect his wife. This, you have to go behind the, the surface, but it's there. God placed Adam in the garden to keep it. The Hebrew word means to protect it. He failed. He let the snake in. He ought never to have let the snake in, because it was one of the beasts of the field. It had no place in the garden. And then Eve failed because she was away from her wife, her husband and met the snake in her own strength and wisdom which she was not expected to do. You've probably heard Ann Baxter say all the troubles of the human race would never have arisen if only Eve had said to the snake I never talked to strange snakes without my husband. 
See, each of them was out of divine order. Surely this tells us that the remedy for our problems is divine order. And that's, I believe, what God is really saying to us today. So, the wife reflects what her husband is. This is very, very true. I'll tell you something else. Children reflect what their parents are. As a visiting preacher, I've discovered that a married couple can conceal their real attitudes towards me, but their children rarely do. And when I go into a home where the children show me love and respect, I know that's what their parents feel towards me. But when the children are sassy, their parents may talk nice to me, but I question whether that's their real attitude. See, we're always revealing ourselves in those to whom we are related. However, coming back now to the church, the purpose of God is to reveal the glory of Christ in the church. God is present everywhere. He's omnipresent. But his glory is where his presence is manifest. It can be seen, it can be felt. Many of us know what it is to feel the glory of God in our bodies, in the atmosphere, to see it on the faces of other Christians. That's something manifest. And the purpose of God in the church is to manifest the glory of Christ, the bridegroom, in the bride. Jesus is not coming for a bent, wrinkled, haggard old crow. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 1 for a moment. Mind you, I'm not in any way speaking disrespectfully of old age. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm just pointing out that the bride that Christ is coming for is going to glorify him. Ephesians 1 verse 11 says this, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. We are to be the demonstration of his glory so that all the universe will praise his glory when they see it in us. And then in Ephesians 5, we have at verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That's, I believe, what he's doing right now. The word that's translated word there, rhema, means the preached word. I believe one of the things that God does at a camp like this is cleanse and sanctify the believers through the preached word that goes forth. Christ redeemed the church by his blood that he might thereafter sanctify by his word. He came by water and by blood. By blood as the redeemer, by water as the sanctifier. He redeems the church by his blood, he sanctifies it by his preached word. And it's only after it has been sanctified that it will be what he intends it to be, which is described in the next verse, verse 27, that he might present it to himself, what kind of a church? A glorious church. That's not just language, that means that the church will be permeated with the manifest presence of God. You know, actually, when you see a young woman who's really in love with her husband, everything in her face just beams love at her. She's radiant. Well, that's how God wants the church to be. A radiant church, without spot or wrinkle. Unbelievably beautiful. Isn't it good that God can do it? He's going to do it. All right, we've got to go on. Now, what's required in our relationship to Christ the Bridegroom as his bride. And I'd like you to turn first of all to a scripture in 2 Corinthians, which I find very, very significant. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2, 3, and 4. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2, 3, and 4. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, which was the product of his ministry. And he says, For I am jealous over you with a, jeal with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Let's look at the picture there and see what it says to us. We have to be 
uh, acquainted with the basic principles of marriage amongst the Jewish people, there were two main ceremonies. The first was espousal, which is something like what we would call engagement. The second, which usually followed about a year later, was the actual marriage ceremony, which was followed by the physical union between the man and his bride. But in Hebrew custom, espousal was a very sacred, binding covenant agreement between a man and a woman. And although they still lived apart, and uh, they did not come together in physical relationship, the woman was bound to the man by that covenant. And if in the course of that time she became related to another man, she was treated as an adulteress, and the relationship was broken by something that was known as a divorce. So solemn was the espousal commitment. And of course, this is exemplified in the story of Joseph and Mary. Joseph and Mary were espoused, they were not married, and when Joseph discovered that Mary was pregnant, he was minded to divorce her, the scripture says, to put her away. Now, Paul says in this passage, I have espoused you as a chaste virgin to Christ. When we become Christians, we are espoused, but the marriage hasn't taken place. That's yet in the future. What is happening in this period between espousal and marriage, our loyalty to Christ is being tested. And Paul says, I want you to be a chaste virgin when you meet the bridegroom. There are some very beautiful thoughts in that. Because if anybody, any group of people, by natural standards, did not qualify to be a chaste virgin, it was the Corinthian Christians. They were prostitutes, homosexuals, effeminate, drunkards. And yet the grace and the blood of Jesus gave them the privilege of being in God's sight a chaste virgin. But now Paul says, be careful that you don't lose your virginity. Be careful that you don't get tricked into a wrong relationship which will make you unfit to be the bride. And this is so highly relevant to our contemporary situation that I want to take a moment or two to look into it. He says in verse 3, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's interesting to notice the parallel between Adam and Eve, which I don't want to press, but it struck me that Adam and Eve had never been physically related when the fall took place. They were, in, in essence, in the state of espousal, not in the relationship of marriage. And Eve's mind was corrupted from loyalty to God and to her husband through the subtlety of the serpent. And so Paul is afraid for these Christians that the devil will get at their minds and corrupt them from the pure simplicity of faith in Jesus Christ and total commitment to him. And in the next verse he describes the way that this could happen. And as I read these words, I just want you to ask yourself, do we not see this indeed happening all around us in the churches of America today? He says, If he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, what kind of other Jesus? Well, a great teacher, the greatest guru, just a little higher than Buddha and Socrates and Plato and Martin Luther King, but not a redeeming saviour. Do we hear another Jesus preach? Do we hear a, a Jesus preach who is not born of a virgin? Who is not truly divine? What's that? Exactly what Paul was talking about. Preaching another Jesus. And then he says, if you receive another spirit... Were these spirit-baptized Christians? Was it possible for them to receive another spirit? Apparently. How? Through receiving a wrong picture of Jesus. In other words, they could open their mind to an error that would open their spirits to a spirit of error. And then he says, or if you receive another gospel, what kind of gospel, gospel could that be? Well, a gospel that speaks only about the love of God and never about the judgment of God. A gospel that just tells us God loves everyone. That talks about the fatherhood of God even over the unconverted. 
The Bible doesn't say the unconverted are the children of God. It says they're the children of the devil. Is that happening today? Why? Because the devil is seeking to corrupt the bride from her loyalty to Jesus Christ. At the close of this age, it's my firm conviction there will be only two groups in Christendom. Not two denominations, but two groups. One will be the bride, the other will be what? The harlot. What will be the difference? Is it speaking in tongues? Is it water baptism? What is it? It's loyalty to Jesus Christ. The bride has remained true. The harlot has been seduced from her loyalty to Jesus. Just look for a moment and you see the two of them presented in the book of Revelation. We won't dwell on it. Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore, the great harlot that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. We see there the description of a church system that is dominating a political system. And then in Revelation 21, Verse 9, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. So there the two are set in opposition to one another. The harlot, the bride. Not a denomination, not a doctrine, but a relationship to Jesus Christ. And I would say both are well advanced in formation in the church today. The bride is nearing completion and the harlot is surely being manifest. And I would add this. People say, well, stay in your church. My counsel is neither stay in your church nor come out of your church. I don't believe preachers really have authority to tell individual believers that. But just make sure that you don't end up in the harlot. I think I have authority to say that. Because there are a lot of churches that have got a lot more of the harlot than the bride in them. This is just an obvious fact. That's not to be controversial. All right. Let's look at two other passages of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. What's the qualification for seeing him appearing unto salvation? What kind of persons will he appear to? Well, out of this verse here, unto them that look for him. What's the key word? Expectancy. That's right. He'll come for those who are expecting him as Savior. For the rest, he will come as judge. And then, in Revelation 19, we need to look at these verses for a moment. Verses 7 and 8. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. You understand? No, we are not talking about espousal. We are talking about marriage. The espousal has taken place. The marriage is yet in the future. But there will come a moment when Christ will be united with his bride in marriage. Though I may not fully understand that, I personally am convinced that it will be a real union. And it will be a productive union. I believe the purposes of God for all subsequent ages will be brought forth out of the union between Christ and his bride. Now we have the description of those who constitute the bride. In the next verse, that's verse 8, To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. In the Bible, fine linen is always a type of purity, all through the Bible. You remember in one place in Ezekiel, uh, 
the priests that were girded with wool were not permitted access to the presence of the Lord. And in Deuteronomy it says you're not to wear a garment of mingled wool and linen or cotton. But there has to be absolute purity in the priesthood. So here fine linen speaks of absolute purity. And it says the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That's the King James translation. But we need to look below the translation. There are two Greek words for righteousness. One is dekaiosune, the other is dekaioma. Now you don't need to bother about the exact form of those words, but dekaiosune is righteousness in the abstract. Dekaioma is righteousness in act. Or an act of righteousness. When you and I believe in Jesus Christ, his righteousness, dekaiosune, is imputed to us. We are made righteous with his righteousness. When we live out our faith, we express that imputed righteousness in dekaioma, which is our work righteousness, our acts of righteousness. Now, very interestingly, the word used here is dekaioma, dekaiomata, plural. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That's a very searching statement. His wife has made herself ready. How? By her righteous acts. In every culture that I've ever known, there's one rule about marriage. The, the, the bridegroom never prepares the bride. The bride always prepares herself. The responsibility is placed on her. The scripture says, his wife hath made herself ready. How? By her outward righteous acts. The imputed righteousness of Christ will not avail for the bridal feast. It's got to be the outward righteousness. My wife and I had a friend, a missionary, years back in Jerusalem a lady whom we knew well, a very precious lady, who became sick. She lay sick a long while, and she thought she was going to die. And she was kind of getting ready in her mind to die. And one night the Lord gave her a very vivid dream. And in this dream, she was working on a beautiful white dress. And as she looked at the dress in her dream, she saw that there was a lot of it that was not yet finished. She realized there was a lot more work to do on the dress. When she woke up in the morning, she realized the Lord had shown her that she wasn't ready to go home because her work was not yet finished. And I always think about that when I hear the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Every one of us has got a dress to complete. And we complete it by our acts of obedience. So this is very important. Let's look at another, a parallel passage in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See the balance there? God works in you, and he works in you first to will, then to do God's pleasure. The Christian life is not struggling to do something that we don't want to do against our will. God works in us the will to do what he wants. Then he works the ability to do it. For God works in us to will and to do. But he only works in us so far as we work out what he works in. God works in, we work out. The measure of what God can work in is determined by the measure of what we work out. So there's a two-way process. God is working into us, but by the way we live, by our righteous acts, we are working out what God has worked in. So the preparation of the bride is to work out what God has worked in. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And we don't want any saints with miniskirts All right, we're going on. Our relationship to one another. That just slipped out, that statement. <laughs> All right. What is required in our relationship to one another? I said exhortation, 
an example, didn't I? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. I believe there's a message there. Verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. As I pointed out the other night, one of the themes of Hebrews is a, is a continual exhortation not to go back on your first faith, because the Hebrew Christians were in great danger of doing that, of almost giving up their profession of faith in Jesus the Messiah and becoming enamored again with the Old Testament worship and the sacrifices. You see, one of the great themes is continually pointing out the superiority of Christ and the New Covenant over the Law and the Old Covenant. And it's addressed to people who were still in some way enamored of the Old, who had made a profession of faith in Christ but were in danger of turning back. And so I think there are five separate exhortations in Hebrews on the dangers of turning back. And here the message is, let us hold fast, let us not give up what we have professed. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. This is part of our responsibility, is not merely to hold fast ourselves, but to encourage one another. To consider how we can provoke one another to love and good works. The word provoke, I think, is deliberately paradoxical. Normally we provoke people to bad acts, to anger and jealousy. But we are to consider how we can provoke one another to good acts, to the outward righteous acts of obedience. And then together with that, we have verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching, the day of Christ's return. So the nearer we come to the day, the greater our responsibility to meet together challenge one another, provoke one another to that which is good, and exhort one another, and watch over one another. Now here is where I believe the small group, the cell group, or whatever you like to call it, has a unique function. Because I think that's where we can do that the best. In a large gathering, the person who's being really troubled or on the verge of backsliding can remain hidden. But in a small group of 10 or 12 persons, very little remains hidden for long. And uh, in the big group, the person who has some deep inner personal problem probably will never come out with it. But in the small group, as we lay bare our lives to one another and meet together and encourage and pray for one another, things come out into the open. Now my experience is, in dealing with cell groups, you come to a point where you're sorely tempted to turn back especially if you're religious. <laughs> this is comical. The people who have never known anything else, they don't have many problems. But the people who are used to being religious, you see, in my, my way of thinking, the cell group isn't a prayer meeting, it isn't a Bible study, and people say, well, what do we do? Just sat and looked at one another. Well, there's something to be said for doing that. Now, I'm not against prayer meetings or Bible studies, but you see, in a Bible study, somebody can sit there and, and remain hidden. In a prayer meeting, they can pray a beautiful prayer. But when it comes to really opening up to one another, every one of us that's been this way has come to the point, well, is it really worth it? And do I really want people to know me that well? <laughs> Wouldn't I prefer to keep my mask on? And here I really believe is something very much related to what we're reading. Because the word that's used in Hebrews there, is your synagogue. The place where you gather together. It's not the word ecclesia, it's not the church assembly. And I think it really is speaking about little meetings where people become very honest with one another. See, I have been concerned for years that people can sit in a church for 15 years, have deep personal problems that never are revealed to anybody. For instance, in many churches, I, as in, in my ministry of deliverance and as a visiting preacher, I've discovered that there are homosexuals. You'd be surprised how many evangelical, Pentecostal churches have people there with the problem of homosexuality. But it never is revealed, because they're ashamed. They don't dare to come out into the open. I had a letter from a young man somewhere in this part of the country, 
and there was about a four-page letter. The first three pages were devoted to getting me ready for what he wanted to tell me. The fourth page was that he was a homosexual. And it took him all that time to take up the courage to make that statement. I wrote back and told him that there was hope, there was a way out. He wrote back and said, you're the first person who has ever done anything but discourage me or reject me. See, so what I'm really talking about is a relationship between believers where when the problems come up, they come out. And we exhort one another and encourage one another, correct one another, but don't reject one another. You've probably heard Bob Bumford's little slogan, correct me, but don't reject me. That's what people are crying out for. Correct me, but don't reject me. I've got this problem. Help me, but don't give up on me. So I really think that this passage in Hebrews here is particularly relevant for the time and the situation in which we find ourselves. Okay, now then we're going on. Oh well, let's take that passage from the Song of Solomon just for a moment, very quickly. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 4. This is the, the bride speaking. She says, or the young lady, she says, draw me and we will run after you. You notice, from singular to plural, draw me and we will run. That's examples. So it's exhortation and example. When the Lord can draw you, the people who see you running will want to run with you. So there's the responsibility of example in our relationship to the bridegroom. If you read through the Song of Solomon, there's much of that there. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? They say, well, I'll tell you. It's the answer of the bride. And that's how we need to provoke people to love and to good works. 